Welcome to Law Society Younger Members Committee Career Information Session number 7. Keen Moriarty talks to Sheila Barr about changing career direction. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Keen Moriarty and I'm a member of the Younger Members Committee of the Law Society and this is one of the um, career sessions that we're running in lieu of our annual conference, which uh, unfortunately and for obvious reasons couldn't run this year. So uh, we're very lucky uh, this evening to be joined by Sheila Barr of Barr Performance Coaching. Um, welcome, Sheila. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Good. How's your how's your uh, your pandemic going for you? Lockdown level five, no problems. Yeah, lockdown level five. It's not too bad. You know, it's not too bad. I'm I'm an optimistic person, so I'm hopeful about uh, good news coming in the spring around vaccines and so on, and making the best of it. You know, yeah. it's um, there's nothing we can do. I'm a big believer in controlling the controllables. You know, so. Uh, so just trying to focus on, on on what you can do to make it a bit better. Yeah, certainly optimism is something we need a huge dose of and more of at the moment. Yeah, Listen, um, tell us about uh, Bar Performance Coaching. Yeah, so uh, Bar Performance Coaching is one of, I suppose, three organisations that I'm involved with. Uh, myself and my husband, Paddy, have Bar Performance Coaching. Um, Paddy worked as a director in Microsoft for many years and, uh, and he left a number of years ago to set up our performance coaching. So we work in it together. Um, Paddy does the, the leadership development and the leadership coaching and I focus on career coaching. Um, I also work with Hannah Carney and Associates um, and Hannah is a, a, an ex-lawyer. She was a partner with McCann's. And uh, so in my work with Hannah, I, um, I work an awful lot with solicitors. Um, so a lot of the time I would work with solicitors who want to make some kind of a career transition. Um, and then I also work with DCU. Um, I work with uh, mature students in DCU who are embarking on courses. A lot of the time it's postgrads in order to affect a career change. So my life is all about uh, career changes. I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to tr career transition. I, I think it's fascinating and I think that it's something that's always possible and I love working with people who kind of come to me when they're in a place where they feel stuck in their career and we tease out how they can make a move that uh, that appeals to them so uh, that's great it's it's great actually when I when I listen to you talking about it obviously I, I imagine that the people who come to you want to feel like that about their about their jobs and their careers and they're looking for that sort of satisfaction so that's great that you you embody it as well you know yeah absolutely and I think it's you have to strike a balance between you know kind of making things sound um too easy and being too much of a cheerleader for for change you know it has to be grounded in realism yeah. um but but my firm belief, and this is borne out by experience, is that if you give it a little bit of time and if you're patient with yourself and if you plan it out, that, you know, career transition and, and increased career fulfillment is definitely possible. Definitely, definitely possible. That's great. And, and I suppose that kind of brings me around to the first point I wanted to discuss with you, which was, I imagine, first of all, that career tra transitions are... A more modern thing or at least certainly becoming increasingly frequent now those kind of jobs for life scenarios have kind of fallen away maybe with my, my parents era and things like that um and so i imagine people are making transitions much more frequently now maybe once or twice even in their lifetime and i just wondered um is there does that what in your view kind of what effect has that had either on the jobs market but also i suppose on um, the people that are coming to you now do you find them to be what are the kind of signs that somebody wants to change careers and uh, to make yeah, that Yeah, so yeah, it, it, there's a couple of things there. I think, you know, very interesting when you pointed out that, say, our parents' generation, you know, things have changed hugely since then. I think that in our parents' generation, certainly in my parents' generation, the expectation was that, you know, you trained for a particular job or profession, you entered an organization, and you were more or less expected to remain with that organization until you retired. And that has completely gone now, as, as you mentioned. And in fact, you were talking about people changing once or twice. Statistically, uh, there's a study which is often quoted by, um, by career change um, exploration and career change study, 
which is that um, a 35 year old today is expected to make a significant career change between six and eight times in their life between when between being 35 and when they stop working. That's so incredible. I know absolutely it is incredible but actually when I was chatting to my husband about this and then I looked back at my own career and I thought I have made uh, that many significant career changes so and, and it's only when you kind of look back and, and, and think about it that that actually it is more common already than you would think. Yeah. Now what I would say is I think the legal profession um, probably has been maybe slower to um, to introduce frequent career change than other industries because in, interestingly an Irish piece of research showed in 2016 that if you were a doctor or an accountant you were much more likely to make a significant career change than a solicitor but right. I think anecdotally in my own experience that that is now is now changing you know that solicitors are more likely to consider possible a move maybe out of private practice into the public sector or maybe from a large corporate firm to a, a smaller firm or maybe even uh, moving from practicing as a solicitor to lecturing or management consultancy, not to mention the very dramatic career changes that you also hear about, you know, from a solicitor to a yoga instructor uh, or from a teacher to a solicitor and back to a teacher again, you know, so it's, um, it's certainly becoming more common. There, there was a, a hilarious, I thought it was very funny at the time, this is about six years ago now, but in the Law Society Gazette, they used to run um, sections where it would talk about solicitors who were now doing something else. Mm. And the one that sticks out in my mind was there was a guy in Cork and he uh, became a comedian, like a stand-up comedian. And I kind of thought like, well, it's not really sort of something that might be open to everybody, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. like it's not nice for him, like, but totally sort of unusual. Uh, for a solicitor to it wouldn't go. be the logical thing yeah it no, wouldn't be but, but, to suggest for sure but brilliant that it worked for him that's fantastic. yeah yeah but so I can imagine obviously there's the sort of the off the wall things as well but getting back to that thing of it of career changing being a more of a modern phenomenon I suppose uh so when somebody comes and says look to you I'm I'm I presume they come and say I'm not happy in my career mm. um what yeah. or how does that sort of manifest itself like I, like I, I could be for example now like we're all working from home and things like that and I'm kind of thinking you have just more time for contemplation and stuff and you kind of check in with yourself from now and every now and then and say well is this really what I want to be spending my time doing and I just wondered what some of those signs might be in yeah, your experience absolutely that's a really good question um I think people generally would come in and they might feel that they were there's a number of things that people report they might find it boring. Um, they might feel, uh, honestly, they might feel that they just really don't care about the work that they're doing. They might feel that they don't see any impact to the work that they're doing. You know, they might feel like they're a tiny cog in a very large wheel and that they, they just, they, they miss seeing any kind of impact or value to what they're doing. They might have a total lack of interest in the work that they're doing. Um, or it could be sometimes the environment that they're working in. So, for example, sometimes a, a successful career change might be somebody work, somebody transitioning from, say, working in a, a practice area in one firm, the same practice area in another firm, but that might be better, or it might be working in the same practice area in the public sector rather than in the private sector, or it might be staying within your organization and moving to another practice area, you know. So, so one of the things that we kind of start talking about is trying to identify what's missing, you know. Um, so trying to identify whether it's the work or whether actually they love the work and it's the environment or vice versa, whether they love the environment, but they wish they were doing something different in it, you know. So... So it's not necessarily always really straightforward and it's really useful to do a little bit of teasing out exactly what's going on with the individual. And then very, very occasionally, it's not actually work at all. It's something else that's, 
that's maybe yeah, and, and yeah and that's exactly what I thought is that you might be you might feel dissatisfied but putting your finger on what is the source of that might be you know less straightforward and, and maybe less clear um, and I, I can see as well and I'm thinking back about it um, every solicitor is a generally qualified you know so you learn criminal and wills and probate and conveyancing and whatever litigation all in your qualification so I suppose when you arrive out of black all place you kind of feel like well I could do anything and then there's so there's jobs for small practices who are looking for people to buy and sell property or there's large corporate transaction type stuff you 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 know you, you, it's exactly what you're describing you're kind of going well you know every I suppose when you're qualified newly qualified everything is open to you because you feel like you have the training and everything mm. but then it becomes about as you say deciding what you what you specifically what you want so yeah. I imagine when somebody comes to you and you can please maybe elaborate a little bit on this when somebody comes to you and comes in the door I presume the first thing unless they and maybe they do know what they or think they know what they want but the first thing as you say is trying to figure out and sit down with that person yeah what what, what is actually your aims and goals here very much so absolutely um if you imagine that there's kind of maybe a um, a spectrum of awareness um, that you would go through where if you imagine that zero is that you have that feeling of being unsettled, unfulfilled, something's not quite right. You, you're, you, maybe you have that Sunday night feeling horribly every Sunday night. You know, I mean, obviously nobody's job is brilliant 100% of the time, but maybe you feel that, you know, you're just not enjoying it, um, but you're not 100% sure of what it is that you do want. And you're also, maybe people also sometimes feel quite stuck where they are, I think as well. Um, so if you imagine that that's one, and then 10 on the other end of the spectrum might be that you know exactly where it is that you'd like to transition into, you know exactly what the role is that you're interested in, but you don't necessarily know how to go about making that, that leap. So the first thing really that we do, um, apart from kind of after we kind of try and tease out just to make sure that it is actually work that that needs to change is kind of at the beginning of that process, it's really important that the individual does a lot of, and we mentioned this earlier, a lot of reflective work, you know, just really thinking about themselves, you know, um, and the objective of this is fairly simple. It's that the client, the individual, the, the, the lawyer, comes up with what I call a career mission statement. So the first thing to identify would be your strengths, the things that you're good at and that you enjoy doing. Because sometimes, and a lot of solicitors I think would be in this boat, you find that you're good at something and you're given more of it uh, because you're good at it, but it's not actually satisfying for you. You know, you want more or you want different or you want to develop. So that can be, you know, that can be one thing um, that's really important is that people might not be using their main strengths every day. And if you're using your main strengths, then you will be happier at work and you'll perform better. So if you're, you know, if you're not doing what you're good at, you know, that's going to affect your confidence, your performance, you know, every aspect of, of, of your working life. So your strengths would be one run key area. The next thing then would be your interests, um, because sometimes people realize that their area of interest um, mm. isn't being served by the work that they're doing at the moment. Um, so another thing that we try and do is really identify what are the areas that you're interested in. And a way that we would do that is kind of by looking back at projects that you were really engaged in, you know, in your career, or maybe even outside of work, or maybe even when you were studying, you know, what did you find most interesting? Um, and, uh, and, and that would be the second area. The next area then would be around your values. Um, and that's something that people maybe don't realize an awful lot of the time has a key is a key element of to what degree they feel that they belong at work. You know, I remember talking to uh, uh, an individual once, not a lawyer, but uh, a young guy who had done economics and finance in UCD. And uh, he had gone to work for a large online gambling company. 
and he absolutely adored the work. You know, he he loved the he loved all of the the the, the maths that was involved and the stats and the probability and, and all of that. He had a fantastic manager. He really loved his team. But at the end of the day, he he just realized that he had a big problem with the whole idea of, of gambling. And then not everybody would have that issue at all. And, and most people wouldn't, and they'd be able to separate us. And, you know, and, and I think the, the organizations like that are really working hard to be responsible. So, but for that individual at that time, he just realized actually everything about this is right, but the whole value thing is too big and I want to move somewhere else, you know? So, so it can be to do with that. And I think that, that a sense of purpose and meaning is increasingly increasingly important particularly to younger people that they really want to have a sense that what they're doing makes a difference and I would meet I would find that a lot with my clients you know that um that they might really enjoy legal work um but they feel they'd like to apply their skills in an environment where um you know where maybe there's a more social value than they would perceive at the moment you know yeah it's totally yeah and actually it reminds me there was a there was a girl in my tutorial group in in Blackhall and she was like she was brilliant like she was really really smart and really clever and uh, she went uh, working in the not-for-profit sector mm. um and obviously you know took all of the the what I imagine to be the financial sort of difficulties, but not difficulties, but you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, that, they were just their lower paid roles, right? Yeah. But yeah. she could have done anything, you know, she was she was really brilliant. Um, but I'd say it just never entered into her mind that she wanted to do anything other than that. And obviously she got huge satisfaction from the work that she was doing in those not-for-profit area. Mm. And um and there's yeah, a huge you know, value for that. You know, yeah, and it, and it obviously it 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 it, it in, you know uh, totally made up for whatever she may yeah. have earned elsewhere or whatever like that. And it was uh, I met up with her a few times since, like, and she's delighted with life, and she's still yeah. working in those areas, and I'd say has no plans to move out of those, those yeah. areas. Yeah, so I, I, that's exactly it. Really and does count for a lot, you know. It really does, and and that kind of you know that's linked in with motivators as well, you know. So even looking as well at the beginning of the process, well, what are you motivated by? And that's a really good example. Like that individual was really motivated by the idea of making a contribution and making a difference and, you know, contributing to society. Um, and, and that worked for her at that time. She was able to do it. Others might have the same motivation and value, but they might say, but look, right now I have a big mortgage that I have to pay. So yeah. what I'm looking to do is maybe transition into something where I maybe get a bit more of a sense of that but I still have the same salary. And then, you know, then that's what they want. And they're kind of clear that's their mission statement. Somebody else might be motivated by the need to have better work-life balance. That's one that I come across a lot, obviously. Um, somebody else might be motivated by the need to progress in the organization. They might find themselves working somewhere where they don't see any progression opportunities and that's their big motivator. So I suppose putting all of those things together, your signature strengths, so the things that make you a little bit different to everybody else, the things that you're good at, your area of interest, you know, the stuff that lights your fire and that, you know, that really um, enthuses you and that you find yourself wanting to know more about and projects that you've really enjoyed working in, your values, so, you know, the, the things that you feel are important um, and your motivators. They are the four areas then that kind of come together to form that mission statement. So the, the objective would be that the individual would say, right, I know what I want, I know what my value is, and I know what I don't want. You know, I know what my non-negotiables are. And that can be really liberating for people because the benefit of that is, is that when you get to the next stage then, which is kind of identifying the possibilities that are out there, you can take stuff off the table if it doesn't fit in with your career mission statement and you can keep the stuff on the table that does because a lot of the time when you're thinking about career change you can be overwhelmed nearly by all of the possibilities and you're thinking well how do I know what I want you know how do I know where I should end up so it, it just helps to I suppose to discern the possibilities that are going to be most suitable to you but you, there's no real getting away from doing this piece of work. You know, I think it's a really key element just that you have that sense of identity. 
Yeah, I know it's that's that's really helpful because I can totally imagine not considering all of those different aspects as you're kind of wondering. Well, I know I'm not happy, but what will I do? Yeah. Um, and uh, like I'm still getting over the fact that I probably won't ever play for hurling for Cork, you know. But it's just really not something that was actually available to me even when I was younger. Um, so yeah, and you just have to be. It helps, I suppose, to have that injection of realism as well because I. I I imagine some people mind drifting off to whatever you know type of career they might love to have but actually it's not realistic at all mm. um and so i suppose moving on from that is it uh, i can see the career transition covers obviously not just a complete break from professional practice but also maybe moving into self-employed and things like that mm. and is there a way of going around uh, or about testing we'll say uh, your interest in an area and to sort of get a better idea before you make that leap um that is a key element of it um and that's i think where you have that kind of it, it's it's one of the reasons that you need to have a bit of patience and a bit of time you know and and kind of you know say to yourself look this is not a quick fix you know if if i'm to if i'm to really make a considered career transition i'm going to have to test out some of my uh, some of my possibilities to make sure that it's what I want. So I suppose you know once the individual has come up with his career mission statement, what what's then kind of the next stage of the process is to generate possibilities. You know to kind of identify what might be out there that uh, that would fit in with you know with the individual's career mission statement and would fit in with their interests, strengths, values, and motivators. Um, so when I'm working with, with clients, um, like this is nearly the, the best part of, of the process. It's uh, the whole kind of brainstorming piece. And what I invite the client to do is I invite them to, um, to over a period of a few weeks, just try and capture in one place all of the things that they're drawn to you know, in terms of, of profession and something maybe outside of the profession if, you know, if, if, if it presents itself. So they'll come then to the, to the next session and they will have a long list of, you know, projects they've worked on, organizations that they admire, people who they would feel are role models, TED Talks that they have found inspiring, books that they have loved, other organizations that they admire, all that kind of kind of a, a real like a mood board or a vision board of of possibilities and ideas and we just kind of tease out and talk through okay what are the patterns that are emerging here you know so uh so it could be then that you know we'd have maybe at the end of that process at the end of that brainstorming session we'd have maybe four or five distinct possible areas that uh, that would merit further research. Um, and I would encourage people, like I was working with a client only last week and we were doing this exercise and we were identifying the kind of the four or five areas. And she said, and you know what, there's also teaching because I always kind of had it in the back of my mind about being teaching, but actually, you know, let's, I, I'm not even going to go there, you know? So I said, no, this is exactly when we should go there. You know, if that's always been kind of in the back of your mind, why not rule it out? You know, why not just look at it, maybe find out a little bit more about what's involved, maybe talk to a couple of people, maybe who have made that move, just so that you can rule it out, but don't die wondering, you know. Uh, that's how it's really healthy, isn't it? So you're not, you just, you don't have that, the grass is always greener, sort of at the back of your mind, like, oh, maybe if I could have, maybe if I should have, you know, yeah, that's exactly. really helpful, actually. Yeah. To, Absolutely. To close the door on it if you can, like, yeah. Exactly, that's it. So, so then the next stage really would be that the that the individual kind of looks at those four or five areas, does a lot of uh, research, does a lot of informational interviews. And by that, I mean that they'd sit down and they'd have an honest conversation with somebody, say, for example, in the teaching, somebody who is working as a teacher, somebody maybe who has gone back to train as a teacher, as a mature student. What was that like? Because obviously there'd be a number of years, you know, a couple of years involved in doing maybe a graduate training program. Um, and just really trying to get a very realistic idea as to exactly what would be involved. So you'd kind of rule out a number of those five or six possibilities by doing that initial research and those initial interviews. 
and then what's left and there might be maybe two or three areas that are left you would then go into the final or the the second last stage which is piloting or testing or experimenting and by that i mean that uh, that you would get as much real world experience in that area as you can so for example if the area was lecturing and i would you know a lot of my my clients who are lawyers would express an interest in lecturing then you would try and get to do a couple of guest lectures maybe in a university or an institute of technology or somewhere that they had a legal studies program you would maybe contact the law society and ask if you can you know become involved in any piece of the education uh, um, part of the law society um, you would look very clearly uh, and very closely at what would be involved. You know, if I did become a lecturer, are there full time opportunities or is it something that I would need to do in tandem with something else? Would I need to get my uh, PhD in order to realistically make a living as a lecturer? You know, asking all of those hard questions, but mostly doing it, you know, experimenting by doing one of the reasons why sometimes career transitions can be unsuccessful is that there's too much focus on thinking and not enough focus on acting, you know, on literally trying out what it is that you're interested in doing in a way that is minimum commitment, you know, so you're not you're not giving up your job just yet, um, but you are taking on maybe a side project that is really giving you a, a feel for what it's actually going to be like to be doing this. Yeah, that's great. That's really helpful. And actually, we always, or like, I just, well, we always, I imagine we always, I hope it's not just me, think about our being like uh, ourselves at the top of the other profession, or at least, you know, kind of like not at the, not at the bottom of the other profession. And so you imagine yourself being a full-time lecturer in a yeah. in university, um, but bringing somebody back down to earth and saying, well, actually, in order to get there, you've got to do a PhD. That'll take you four years and 30 grand. You know, that's commitment that you have to make. Or, yeah. I like that can be enough. I would say probably a lot of the time that could be enough. Um, Absolutely. And, and just on that, um, Kian, sorry, it's, um, you know, so what, what I'd also is really important is that sometimes it's a case of making one small change uh, that actually can make a big difference. So if you are drawn to lecturing, say, but you decide that you have to rule it out because, you know, you're, you're, you know, you do your research, you, you do, deliver the guest lectures, and for whatever reason you decide, actually, it doesn't fit in with what I need at the moment, based on the work that you've done earlier on, you could still decide, but you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to try, my objective now is to do more of this. Uh, and to make maybe one small change in my own work or to keep on my involvement with the Law Society and doing a bit of lecturing there or continuing working with DCU or UCD or whoever and doing a, a guest lecture, you know, every semester for their, you know, their group that's studying family law or whatever it is. I would be a very firm believer in, you know, just making small incremental changes can have a huge impact on it doesn't have to be all or nothing like it doesn't have to be all or nothing and can I just give you one small anecdote of a of an individual that I was working with now she's actually a teacher so it's not a solicitor um, but she came to me and she said you know we did all of the, the the initial work and her area of interest hugely is interior design you know I mean that's she is passionate about it she probably should have done it you know uh, but she did teaching and she quite likes teaching but she loves interior design uh, so anyway she went off and she did her research and she then um, as part of that she was connected with an interior designer she shadowed that interior designer for uh, a week and and really enjoyed it the interior designer suggested to her that she do a, a taster course in one of the um, interior design um, colleges or institutes in Dublin. She did that. She's now on to her second or third follow on um, uh, course with that same institute. So she's kind of on her way to becoming credentialed as an interior designer. She's still working as a teacher. Um, she hasn't managed to, to transition out of that yet full time into interior design, 
but she's working kind of on the side on a number of projects with the original interior designer that she kind of did the shadowing with way back 18 months ago. And when she was last in, in touch with me, she said, you know, I haven't made the career change, but I'm really happy. Yeah, you that's know? great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And it, yeah. And so it doesn't, you can kind of almost have your cake and eat it. You know, yeah. you can. No, not that wouldn't suit everybody. And not everybody has the holidays that a teacher has, which <laughs> obviously helps, helps that, that person. But what I suppose what I'm saying is, is that it, it's a process, you know, it's a process. She may well have the opportunity to transition into, um, into interior design and she'll be brilliantly positioned when that time comes, you know. Yeah, that's great. I suppose if, if I could say one thing, and I know we're out of time, uh, Kian, but if I could say one thing, it would be, I think that it's really important that people don't focus too much on the outcome and actually allow themselves to enjoy the exploration and looking at possibilities and trying things out and maybe focus on enjoying that part of it and being in a kind of a, a learning growth mindset, a beginner's mindset, trying things out and being open to that rather than being focused on what is the outcome? Where am I going to end up? I want answers. Yeah. It's just not putting yourself under that pressure to get to where I think I need to go as quickly as possible sort of thing and just yeah. sort of really getting to know yourself a bit better, I suppose, That's and it. getting to know. It's, it's, yeah, I've, I've it written down on my whiteboard here behind me, focus on the exploration instead of the result, you know? It's the journey, it's not the destination. It's the journey, That's well, it. Yeah. Um, that's great. Um, I suppose, look, is there anything, I, what I did want to discuss with you is, um, is there anything that gets in the way of, of a successful career transition? I suppose just to bookend it, is there something that people should be concerned about in that, in that space? Yeah, I, I mean, I suppose I think that there, there can be a number of things that, that can get in the way. A lot of them are around our mindset, you know, um, and, and I alluded there a moment ago to, you know, if, if, if you're not open-minded and if you don't feel that you're in a place where you can be open-minded and and you know kind of ready to think outside the box dare I say it a little bit then then that can be challenging um I think the other thing is I think for lawyers particularly um you know that can be difficult because lawyers are trained to be you know be very much about um taking things apart looking for risk looking for evidence, looking for certainty, you know, trying to be as, um, you know, as, as, as certain as they possibly can about things and wiping out all of the what ifs uh, and all of the, all of the kind of maybe the, the, the roads less traveled. Um, so, so it can be a challenge for, for a lawyer to maybe decide, right, I am getting into a, a mindset where I will be open to possibilities and maybe take a risk I can guarantee you that anybody you know who has made a, uh, a career transition that looked easy, that there were a couple of false starts, there were, you know, there were risks taken along the way and, uh, and that, that can be just part of it, you know. So I suppose maybe uh, that can get in the way too sometimes, just having, um, having that focus on certainty and that need for certainty can, can sometimes get in the way of, of kind of going through that process and trying things before you eliminate them or decide to take them further. Yeah, and I, I think every solicitor with some experience will have come across a client who say, just can't get out of their own way. Yeah. They're saying like, there's a practical, there's a, there's a much more beneficial outcome here than the one that you think that you want, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's very helpful, yeah. Um, I think we leave it there, um, but uh, certainly, well, there's a couple of things. Um, the first thing is to say to everybody on the call um, that there's, you can register there's going to be more of these career sessions and so please register i hope you found this evening uh, helpful I, I certainly did and i it's opened my mind into um more being more i suppose conscious of career transitioning um so please register for any of the further uh career uh, talks that are coming up that we're running the one thing i wanted to ask you sheila but actually i don't want to ask it anymore is whether there were certain industries or areas that were more suitable than others for solicitors to, to transition into but actually I almost don't want to ask you know because you've, the way you've described it is well it's individual and it's all about sort of what you want not necessarily slotting your skill sets into something else yeah. um, but we may as well ask it anyway are there certain industries that solicitors are more suited to? 
Yeah, and, and an awful lot of the time people ask that, you know, they come in and they say, right, I don't think I want to be a solicitor anymore. What can I do? What am I going to ask? Yeah. Yeah. Straight in at the same salary. And, 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 and you're absolutely right. I completely understand why people would, would start from that position. But I then spend a lot of time, say, you know, saying to them, well, look, I mean, that all depends on what is important to you. So for example, uh, like we would have, you know, we would have individuals who would have moved from the law to communications, you know, um, but that would be because what they loved about being a lawyer and what they wanted to take with them was, you know, a love of writing, um, a love of maybe, you know, communicating something to clients. That was what they, what they found really enjoyable, but maybe they wanted to do that in a different environment or, in an area where they felt that there was more meaning and purpose for them. But for somebody else, maybe who was a lawyer, but really didn't like the writing part of it or the drafting part of it at all, then that wouldn't be a suitable area to go to. Um, I suppose traditionally, you know, people have gone into areas like management consultancy. Um, people have, you know, maybe moved into an in-house role and then done a sideways move in that in-house role so that or, or in that organization where they're working where they start as an in-house solicitor you know you, you then might have it open to you to move into another department um in the same organization and then from that organization to a different organization so that way you get out of you know the, the kind of the purely legal role but we have had people um you know i i know of people who have gone into not-for-profit uh, like yourself I know of people who've gone from public to private and vice versa. I know of people who've become, you know, who've uh, started up their own businesses in an area that is really interesting to them. You know, um, people who've worked, you know, I know uh, an ex-lawyer is now CEO of Swim Ireland. Um, you know, like it's, the list is endless. An ex-lawyer being a yoga instructor, an ex-barrister own, owning a tennis equipment shop. So, you know, barristers going into the diplomatic corps, the list is endless, the possibilities are endless. And really, it's all you can, it's, it's all about your own career narrative, because everybody's so different. It will make sense for, for you to maybe go into uh, something to do with sport, because you're a big core curling fan, and you can fit that in, you know, with, with your legal career, and you'll make it make sense, you'll, and you'll make it work. And well, well now, now I'm thinking yoga is where I should uh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. set my sights on. That sounds like something I could do for the next 20 years. Yeah. Um, Sheila, that's great. Look, that, that was really helpful. And um, I hope that uh, people got a benefit out of that because uh, I certainly did anyway. In terms of just being just more, more self-conscious about your where you're at and where you want to be at. Mm -hmm. um, if there's any questions, uh, we'd open it up uh, to questions. If anybody wants to throw something into the chat box there. Um, lots of thank you, Sheila. Can you see the chat as well? Lots of thank yous yeah, and uh, compliments you. on your presentation, which is great. Thank you. Okay, uh, no questions by the looks of it. Um, so I think we can leave it there. Uh, Sheila, look, that's great. So um, Sheila Barr Performance Coaching, if uh, people want to get in touch with you. And I, I certainly think it's what it sounds to me is that it's not just about when you want to make a total, you know, 180 uh, change. It's also, if you want to move into being in-house or self-employed, or if you wanted to even between firms to look at a different sector, um, worth having, uh, getting somebody to sort of tease those possibilities out with you. Um, so that's great. That's really helpful. Thank you uh, so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. And I really enjoyed the chat as well, Kian. Thanks a million. Great. You're more than welcome. Um, so actually, please, can you share Sheila's contact details? Do you want to? Um, yeah, absolutely. 